This sermon is from the series entitled, Eyewitness Accounts, the Gospel of Luke, preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. What is the most revolting or hurtful thing someone said to you? Maybe I could ask the other question. What's the most hurtful or revolting thing that you've said to people? I can think of some, some pretty nasty things I've said to my own parents uh, over the years in, in anger. Maybe it was a family member that made a comment, and even when you think about it today, it still hurts when you think about it. Maybe it's a boss or a coworker or a classmate who said something about you that really sticks. But what was your reaction to it? Was it anger? Was it hurt? Was it frustration? A mix of probably everything. Well, I begin my sermon this morning with that because today what we're going to find is that one of the sons in a parable that were most people who've been in church for a while, and even if you haven't been in church or never grew up in church, might have even heard it's that kind of a story. It's a parable, as Brian said, of uh, often referred to as the parable of the lost son. Um, but in it, the son's said some pretty revolting and angry stuff to his dad. We sometimes lose it because we're not kind of in the culture of that day. Um, But I want you to think about that as we read through the story, because everything that these sons do to their dad is a pretty big slap in the face. And it's not just the youngest son who uh, gets that. The older son does some things too, and we'll unpack it as we look at the sermon. But just contrast your own way that you would respond to it, at least I know how I would respond to it, compared to the way that the father in the story does it as you hear it. So, Here at Crossway, we just preach through a book of the Bible, and we're preaching through Luke. I think we're actually going to look at Ruth if you for Advent. Um, uh, Just switch it up a little bit, and Ruth has some great themes that work towards a Christmas story that you may not see. So that's what we're going to do next. But we'll continue till Luke till Advent starts. Um, And so here we find ourselves in Luke 15, verse 11 through 32. And uh, you can find it in your Bibles in front of you. We've got a, a app that you, you version app that you can read along to. Um, and there are sermon notes in the back uh, of the bulletins if you need them. And maybe I didn't print off enough as I look at the numbers here today. But this is the word of the Lord. Jesus continued, there is a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out to go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back home safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now to understand this passage, you, we need to understand the setting of it. 
And because we kind of looked at two parables last week and said, and we're looking at the third, it's easy to kind of miss it, uh, miss it because of where we started. And so in order to get the setting, we need to go from the very beginning of this kind of pericope, which is just kind of this section of scripture. And if you remember last week, what we said is in Luke 15, 1 and 2, that Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and, and sinners. And uh, he's hanging out with the, what most of the religious leaders were thought that people they needed to stay away from because they were afraid that they would kind of make them impure. But these are the people that were attracted to Jesus. I mean, sometimes we have this image of Jesus that he's just, you know, not that charismatic of a figure. But it's interesting, that's not the way the Bible presents it. The Bible presents him literally drawing crowds and drawing people from all over, all walks of life, all backgrounds, and all different life experiences, some good and some bad. And in this story, what we see is that the Pharisees and the religious leaders are picking, are angry that Jesus, a Jewish teacher, is hanging out with those who have kind of a different background and aren't really the greatest people. If you remember, the tax collectors were viewed as traitors because they were Jews who worked for the Roman government who was oppressing them. And even worse, they were viewed as greedy traitors because they were stealing money from the Jews and charging more tax than they needed to. And so they were wealthy at the expense of the Jews, and they were as despised as despised can be. I mean, you think about your worst group that you hate. That's who they are. Now, we might not use the word hate, but we would use the words to describe them. It would feel it in our hearts where it just raises our blood pressure when we even think about those groups. That's the setting. And these religious leaders were complaining that Jesus was hanging out with them. That's not what a good moral person, a good religious person should do, they say. And so Jesus told three parables about someone losing something and rejoicing when it was found. That's the way the story is set up. The first two that we looked at last week were the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And in both of them, a shepherd and a woman lost something that was important to them. And they did everything they could to find it. They did everything they could do to find it. And it's in that moment that they, when they found it, that they rejoiced and were excited. And what we saw here is in that section is that there's a heart of God that has, shows kindness and care and, and, and has this kind of rejoicing, it says, in heaven, that when baptism like this happens, when Penny and Anthony put their hope and trust, there is an excitement, which is kind of exciting to think about it, if you think about it, that when somebody puts their hope and trust in Jesus and admits that they're more messed up than they would care to admit and need a savior, that all of heaven rejoices. It's, it's not an attitude of like, well, it's about time. It's not an attitude of, you know, I can't believe it took you this long for you to figure out. It's, no, they understood the implications of their life, and there's rejoicing. And so Jesus continues by telling another parable. Now, to understand this parable, you have to see that it's broken down into two acts. The first act is dealing with the tax collectors. It's speaking to them. They are more the younger brothers. And so it focuses on people who've walked away. And that's what we see. The younger son is set up in that way. The younger son's folly is the whole first part of this parable. And in it, it's pretty simple. He he basically starts off the parable by telling his father that he wants him dead. When he asked for his inheritance, it was like literally saying, Dad, I would kill you, but I know the ramifications of it. So give me your money instead. And that would have been revolting. I mean, think about it if you said that to your dad today. I don't think my dad would really think that was a kind thing for me to say. But in that day and age where there's the whole honor system and you had to respect your dad in a different way, that would have been a terrible, terrible thing to say. And so he starts it off by saying, hey, give me, I want you dead and give me all the money that I am owed. Now, this would have been probably, if there's only two brothers, a third of the inheritance, because the brother would have gotten a second share. And so the father does this. We'll see that he shows him kindness. But the son doesn't just take it that way and give the affront to his dad. He takes it to another level. He, He moves away. He needs to get out of town. He can't handle this family anymore. And so he splits. 
And what we see is that what he does is he squanders his inheritance. Now, that's all it says. It doesn't go into details here. Now, the brother, older brother makes all kinds of assumptions about what his younger son, his brother, is doing. But it just says that he squandered his wealth in wild living. That's the, the phrase there. And so he lived it up. I mean, he had money. He had wealth sooner than he should. And so he decided he was going to take advantage of it. But what often happens in life is things kind of catch up to him. And that's exactly what happens. There's a famine and he hits rock bottom. So much that he has to get hired out as a servant and feed pigs. Now, for you and I, I think pig, I think bacon, that's a good thing. I mean, I wouldn't mind raising a couple of pasture pigs and, you know, butchering them for bacon. But if you're a Jewish person who has viewed bacon and eating pigs as a bad thing, and you weren't allowed to eat them for so long, for you to have to go from being the wealthy person to desolate on the streets and feeding pigs, it would be about as low as you could get. I mean, this would be like, I know they don't do the Dirty Jobs show anymore, although maybe it's come back. I don't know. With Netflix, you never know. You can still watch those things. But it's about as dirty of a job as you're going to get. And it's about as low of a job as you're going to get. And we can sense that in this, the way that Jesus tells the story, and it's a story that's supposed to teach a lesson. It's about who we are and how God responds to us. It's a parable. In that, we see that he kind of comes to his senses a little bit. And he's desperate. And that's usually what happens in life. It's not often in our, our big successes that we learn life's lessons. At least that's not the way it is for me. It's when life is dark, when life doesn't go the way that I want it to, that really kind of my, what's happening inside of my own heart is revealed. And, and we look to other places for help. And so we see that that's exactly what he does. He's in this spot. He's eating and he's so hungry that he has to eat the slop that the pigs eat because he's got nothing else. And he thinks to himself, man, even my parents' hired hands are better off than this. So I know I've blown it and I can't be a son. That I've already ruined. I basically told my dad I wanted him dead and I, ruined, I took I spend all the money he gave me. But man, I got to tell you that even being his hired hand would be better. Maybe, maybe I can kind of play up his soft spot a little bit. And if I admit that I've messed up and I and say that I can no longer be your son, but I'll, I'll be your servant, that maybe, maybe he'll accept me and I can have things taken care of. And so he devises this plan to kind of use his father's soft spot and his wealth to build himself back up again. And so that's what he does. And so what we see here is this is where the son's gone through. The son basically told his dad off. He took his inheritance. He squandered it. And now he's in the lowest spot possible. And he's looking for whatever help he can get. Now, remember that the father had lost a son and he had been highly disrespected and he's still carrying on. He doesn't know what's happened to his son. He's going through all the emotions that a parent would go through. I mean, can't even imagine what Deb and Dana are going through with their son-in-law, waiting if he's going to come back. But he's probably full of, at least I'd be full of anger. Like, how dare you treat me like that? The natural response, the response that the Pharisees wanted Jesus to give in this situation, when they were critiquing him for hanging out with the sinners and the tax collectors, is one of judgment and show shame, and make somebody earn their way back. And even the younger son, like, that's his way. He's like, I'm not a son, but I'll work for you, and we can work this thing out. He kind of is in the same spot. But the way that Jesus crafts the story is similar to the way that the other parables went. And there is this compassion and this kindness that's tenacious in this father, and, and, and the father, what he does, rather than, than you know, letting his son come up and having a conversation with him or, or making him prove that he's in a good spot before he even has a conversation to him, he shows him compassion in so many different ways. The first one is he actually gave him the inheritance there, but even more than that, after that affront, what does he do? He sees his son 
and the language is that he sees him looking. He's looking, hoping that his son will come back. And when he sees him afar way off, the father is in a dead sprint to go get him and embrace him. Now here's the deal. In the culture of that day, fathers don't run. Fathers walk with dignity. And they would wait for their son to come to them. But Jesus says that the father sprinted to his son to meet the son that was lost. And the way that he engages his son shows that there's a heart of compassion and kindness the, the son starts off with this spiel that he's got worked out in his head. He's like, Dad, I've, I've sinned against, fa- against heaven and against you, and I'm not bound to be able to be your son. And before he can even get to the negotiation part where he says, I'm going to become your hired hand, the father cuts him off and says to the servant, go get the best robe, go get the ring, go get everything and give it to my son. Now, I want you to think about what it would be like to be that younger son. You are at rock bottom. You are in your lowest low. And you're coming back just to grovel to your dad to hope that he'll hire you and take you on. Because you know that you've done everything you can to offend him. And in that moment, your dad treats you way better than you ever deserve. And he does everything he can to make you realize that he loves you and embraces you in exactly the state that you're in. He puts on the best robe and he brings a party. And he does everything he can to make him part of the family. That's what all those things, the ring, the clothes, all of that. He cuts him off and doesn't even let him negotiate. But rather he says, you've returned and I am embracing you in exactly that state. Think about a moment in your own life when you've had that, where you know that you've done something to hurt somebody, and they don't treat you the way that your sins deserve, or the way that you treated them deserve. They show you kindness. I mean, it can be all kinds of different ways. This is the heart of the Father that we see here. But he doesn't just return him and, and bring him into the family. No, this guy throws a party and wants to invite him and enfold him into the entire community. And so he throws a party. Now we know it's a party because he kills a calf and not a goat. Do you see the language of the older brother? He's like, you didn't even give me a goat. A goat would feed a couple of my friends. You're killing a calf, which is, means you want to have an entire celebration with the entire village and everybody surrounding that your son has returned. Now, even to do that would open the father up to this whole shame of people would come and say, well, what kind of father is he? I mean, he gave his inheritance to this guy and he squandered it. And now he's excited that he's coming back. But the father doesn't care. What the father cares about is that his son has returned. And so he creates a party and then celebrates the return after bringing him into his family. And the point of all this is that Jesus wants to remind us that God's ready to reconcile with those who've turned their back on him. I mean, God is the father in this character, and the younger son is those tax collectors and the sinners, the outcasts, the people who've messed up more than they would care to imagine and understand the weight of it. The people who the religious leaders said, you need to stay away from them. They gotta prove that they've got their life figured out before they can become part of the family of God. And we're critiquing Jesus for spending time with them. And Jesus says, if you want to understand the heart of God, what you need to realize is that it's exactly those kind of people who know how messed up and broken and defeated they are, those are the people that I'm going to run out and embrace. If there's ever a front to what the Pharisees just did and what they just said, it's this parable. And that's what Jesus wants to remind us of, that even if it feels like we're far from God, even if it feels like we've, we just wanted to get away from him, and you know, it doesn't mean that you live this terrible life. 
I mean, we can be quote, morally good people and still just say, you know what, I don't want to spend time focusing on you. It's the same kind of distancing away from him. There's all kinds of different ways we can be the younger son, more than we would care to admit. But the fact of the matter is this, is that God is ready to reconcile. He embraces, he reaches out, he goes after us even when we've turned our back on him. Because the truth of the matter is, every single person in this room, including myself, have turned their back on God. But the love of God is greater than that. He pursues us. That's why Romans says, you see, at just the right time where you're still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we are God's enemies, we are reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? I want you to look at the adjectives that are used to describe the way that Jesus died, us, in the state that we were in when Jesus died for us. It's not a great list. I know I hit this from time to time, but we all need to remember this. It says that while we were still sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were powerless, while we were enemies of God, it's in exactly that state that God, Christ died for us. And that's what Jesus is saying. Is God doesn't wait for us to get our life and our act all together to embrace us. No, he embraces us in our life as messy as it is. And that's the truth that the younger son reminds us of. That God's kindness is greater than our sin. And it's exactly in that state, as broken and messed up as we are, that Jesus rushes out to us. And again, it doesn't mean that our life has to feel all sinful and broken or all that, but just that we've run away from him in any kind of a way. But there's a second act to this. Jesus isn't done. He says to the tax collectors and the sinners, the, the people, and to the Pharisees, listen, God's heart is to go after those that are, are broken and care to admit it. But there's a whole second act to this parable. I mean, I probably could have done two sermons, to be honest with you but I'm gone next week, so Ralph gets another parable. <laughs> but act two is the elder son. And the elder son is just as hard-hearted towards his father. You see, he does all the right things. He stays, he does the jobs. He, he does all of that, but he doesn't really do any of the expected things. I don't know how many of you are parents, but you know this when your kids do it, right? You ask them to do a chore, and they're like this. <sighs> okay. And then they mope around, and they do it in this cranky way. Am I the only one who did that to their parents? I had that, I had that eye roll and that ha <sighs> down pat. I have perfect kids. They don't do that. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm joking, Okay. But I also can't paint them in a terrible light, right? They're, they're just kids. But the fact of the matter is, is this was the attitude of the, of, the, of the older brother. He did just enough to do what he needed to do, but his heart wasn't right there. And we see it in the very beginning. When the father and the younger son are fighting, and he, the younger son asks for his inheritance, as an older brother, his responsibility would have been to step in and try and repair their relationship, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care about his father and he doesn't care about his younger son. All he cares about is eventually getting what he's gonna get. And when his father throws a party, he doesn't enter it. He refuses to enter it. There's a party, there's a big scene, and he stands outside and he yells, or he, he talks to a servant, and refuses to come in, even after the servant pushes him and says the reason why they're having the party, he refuses to enter it in. I mean, if this were a movie, it would be that awkward moment when you know the music is blaring and then all of a sudden it goes quiet and somebody yells something completely inappropriate and everybody hears. Everybody would have noticed that the older son is just sitting outside there unwilling to come into the party. 
And then when the father is, shows the same kindness that he does towards the younger son and, and pursues him, he speaks as disrespectfully to his father as he can. I mean, he doesn't even call him his dad. He, it's all transactional. And you think about the things that he accuses his dad, uh, his dad of doing. I mean, he doesn't call him by his name, which would have been almost like a cuss word in that day, not acknowledging that relationship. And then after that, he accuses his dad of favoritism and not caring for him. He says, look, you've never done one thing nice for me. You wouldn't even give me a goat. And now this guy squandered everything and did everything, and you're giving him a cow. He accuses his father of favoritism and not caring about him. And that's where he sits. But what we see is that the heart of the father is the same towards the younger son and the elder son. And he shows just as much compassion to the elder son as he does the younger son. I mean, we see it here that he leaves the party to go speak. He just is excited that the younger brother is here. And if there's ever a time to come in anger and say, get yourself in line, change your attitude. Those words probably have come out of my mouth before. That would be it. Or he could just say, fine, if you're going to be that way, I'm going to stay here and you just do your thing and I'll do mine. And that would have been the culturally good thing to do. Because for him to stoop to go talk to his son brought shame because he submitted to his son and acquiesced to him. But that's not the heart of the father. The heart of the father goes after that stubborn one who thinks he's got life all figured out just as much as he does the son that feels like his life is broken. And he leaves the party and goes and speaks to that son. And when he does, he responds so lovingly to this elder brother and his harsh words than you could ever imagine. The uh, The son who doesn't even want to acknowledge him that he's the father says, the first words out of his mouth are my son reminding him of his care and his love for him. And then he, he goes and he assures the older son that, look, I, everything you have will be taken care of. Everything you have, it's all of it is mine, is yours. This new son coming is not going to change your status whatsoever. You'll be taken care of. But he, he kindly encourages him to come and celebrate the return of his younger brother. Now, we don't know how the story ends. Jesus lives it with a cliffhanger. The showdown between the dad and the older son. Is he going to respond and come in the manner that he should? Is he going to go, Dad, you're right. I mean, man, I just treated you terribly, and I treated my younger brother terribly, and I'm going to come into the party. We'd hope that would be the case, but we don't know. But what we see here is that Jesus is taking shots at those religious leaders because that same attitude of the older brother is the attitude that they had towards Jesus and towards the sinners and the tax collectors. And he's giving them the same invitation that he gave to the tax collectors, and he's showing the same kindness to them. And what he's trying to show us is that God's kindness and his compassion is extended to those self-righteous religious folk as much as it is those who are aware of their sin. There's ever kind of a, a spectrum of people. It's those that are messed up and those that think they're better than everybody else. And in this parable, Jesus shows the heart of a father who treats them with more kindness than they deserve and embraces them and challenges them in exactly those states. I love this quote. It's by an old seminary professor. He says, the longer you're in church, the more you can resemble the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. I don't like hearing that. I don't know about you, but I think there's some truth. Sometimes 
when we're in a church, we can have this kind of self-righteous attitude that we're better than other people. And for some people who might even be here today, that attitude is what, <laughs> I want nothing to do with Christianity. But I want you to see that Jesus confronts that attitude. But he doesn't confront it with judgmentalism. Instead, he pursues it with kindness. That's why in Romans 2, the passage says that it's the kindness that leads us to repentance. And if you look at that passage in Romans 2, verses 1 through 4, it's all about Jesus basically talking, or Paul talking to religious folks who were thought they were better than everybody else and judging everybody else. And, and what he says is the condemnation that you, you're bringing towards others is actually heaping on you. But what you need to realize is this, is that you can get out of this. You can be broken from the self-righteousness. But the way that you do it is not by getting your fix, getting everything fixed. It's by recognizing the kindness of Jesus. And so that same tenacious father who pursues the younger brother whose life is a mess and realizes it, pursues that person who thinks they have life all figured out and doesn't even need him. The story of the prodigal sons is a story of a father who pursues people even when they don't deserve it, who shows them kindness. And if there's ever a story that sets us up for what Jesus accomplishes on the cross, that is it. You and I were dead in our sin, that passage in Romans said, but Christ willfully laid down his life for us. So whether we struggle with our lives being a mess, or whether we struggle with our lives being a little self-righteous and condemning other folks. And newsflash, we kind of deal with both. The kindness of God is greater than that. And he pursues us even when we don't deserve it. And if there's a lesson that this parable wants to teach us, it's that God wants to show us compassion and kindness, no matter what state our hearts are in. And his spirit wants to draw us into his family through the faith that Penny and Anthony communicated to us here today. That's worth celebrating. That's worth remembering. And I can't think of a better way to do it than to take communion, which is what we do here at Crossway every week. So let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.